Hello everyone and welcome. Let's quickly recap week number five of dynamics. We had talked about rigid bodies and to us a rigid body is a collection of material points which has a certain mass density that we call a rho and we usually denote this by calligraphic B for the body. And what we discussed was how do these things move and what causes the motion. And these are the typical two categories that we talk about. We begin with the kinematics of a rigid body and here we learned that if we take two random points on the body, let's call them points A and B. Let's say A is here, B is there. Then the motion of these two is of course related because they're sitting on the same rigid body. In particular, we showed that the velocities are connected by the so-called velocity transfer formula. So the velocity at point B is the velocity at point A plus, and now comes the contribution from rotation, which is omega, the angular velocity vector, cross the distance vector from A to B. And so if you know the velocity at any point A, you want to know the velocity at point B, all you need to know is what's the angular velocity vector. Remember, there was a vector pointing in the direction about which we're rotating, and its magnitude is the angular velocity. And that's the distance vector. And then we had a second relation, which was the so-called momentum uh, transfer formula, Oh, sorry, no, acceleration transfer formula, which told us that the acceleration of point B is the same as the acceleration of point A, plus, now we took a time derivative, omega dot cross RAB, plus, what is the second term, which is omega cross omega cross RAB. Here we have two extra terms that come in and that allow us to relate the accelerations at two different points, A and B. And this describes the motion of this rigid body over here. There's one special point, of course, like also for systems of particles, we can always define a center of mass. The definition is analogous to a system of particles. And we describe this as a rigid body moving through space with its center of mass having a unique location. And the center of mass is important because we want, of course, to take a look at the kinetics. And the kinetics tell us how the motion is related to forces and torques being applied to the body. And so what we learned here is that linear momentum balance, LMB, is very, very similar to everything we've seen before. It states here in particular that the sum of all forces acting on the body, and here we want to be a tiny bit careful for systems of particles we said external forces. That's of course also true here, but in this particular case, if we don't cut the system open, and the only forces we see are external forces, there are no links or springs in between or so, so we usually don't deal with internal forces, which is why we usually just omit this X, because all forces that we consider here acting on the body are, by definition, external forces. And so the sum of all these forces, the resultant or net force, is nothing else but, well, mass times acceleration. In this kind of type, it's, uh, in this case, it's capital M, the total mass, times the acceleration of the body, and here, this becomes the acceleration of the center of mass. So again, we can interpret this rigid body as a super particle, if you want, which has all its mass concentrated at the center of mass, and the motion of the center of mass follows the sum of all forces being applied. In that sense, it's very, very similar to a system of particles or even a single particle of effective total mass M. And then the AMB, angular momentum balance, became a little more complicated here. In principle, it reads the same as before, namely the net moment applied with respect to point B. In principle, external, but again, we don't write it down because all forces we consider for us are external over here. And this is what? Oh, this pen is better. This is nothing else but the rate of change of angular momentum, HB dot, plus velocity of point B cross P. And this P over here is now the total linear momentum of the body. So this would be the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. But hey, that's again the same as for a system of particles, or even for a particle. The catch is, of course, the definition of this HP dot. What is the angular momentum for a rigid body? We've seen that this is quite complicated. And if we want to write this out, what it becomes is d by dt off. First, we have a term that involves this moment of inertia tensor. IB times omega. I'll get to this in just a moment. And then we had plus the total mass times 
the distance vector or the position vector of the center of mass minus the position vector of point B, the one with respect to which we want angular momentum, cross BB. And then, of course, there's this term left, so we have plus another VB cross the linear momentum, which is just that. Okay. So this looks very complicated, but as before, we should watch out, because many of these terms, we can actually make them cancel by choosing point B in a careful way. In particular, if we look at these two terms here, what we saw in class is that these two terms vanish. So these two are equally zero if, and here are the important choices to keep in mind, either point B is fixed, as before, so the velocity of point B is zero, or, this is different, if point B is the center of mass of the body. Here we have two terms, right? This is just like systems of particles, where we had uh, similar uh, scenarios that we discussed. Here, this extra term comes in, and this one vanishes if these two conditions hold. So the whole thing means if we choose point B, either as a fixed point, a bearing, a hinge, a certain point we know is not moving, or the center of mass, then we know that these two terms cancel, and the only thing we're left with is this. And then things simplify quite a bit. If, for example, this IB tensor is constant, doesn't change with time, then we're back to what we've known for a long time, and this is the special case of the 2D reduction. If we want to write this in 2D, then what we'd seen before was that the, oops, I don't need the bar anymore, the net torque applied in this case was nothing else but now we take a time derivative again if IB is constant it's just that times omega dot right and in this case this IB we had seen this in 2D already this is the moment of inertia and in particular if we write this in 2D and if we write this with respect to the center of mass so what I could do here is I simply remove this and oops that's not too pretty I ex exchange this by the center of mass, then this thing over here is what we call the centroidal moment of inertia. Centroidal moment of inertia. Okay, and this one is that's a constant that we should know, and we should know for certain bodies, the ones we discussed here in particular. I'm just going to continue up here. If we look at examples, the ones that oops, everyone should remember is, among others, a disk rotating about its center, right? In this particular case, we had seen that this ICM was nothing else but the mass times radius squared over 2. We had also seen that if you take a long and slender bar and you rotate about the center of mass, in this particular case, it was nothing else but mass times the length of this thing. So here R is the radius, L is the length, squared divided by 12. And we can derive these for all kinds of bodies. We'll talk more about this next week and trying to find ways to most easily derive those. A long time ago in class, I actually showed one exercise where we calculated the moment of inertia of just a thin ring, basically a bicycle wheel that has the mass concentrated at the outer rim. In this case, we saw it was m times r squared. And so for any rigid body, we can generally calculate this thing. Why is it a tensor? Just one note on that, because in principle we can rotate in 3D about any possible axis. And so think, for example, about the classical one I also show in class, which is, let's say, you take a book and you throw it up in the air. And you want it to rotate. Now, you can rotate, of course, about three different axes and many others. It could rotate about this axis over here, right? In this case, this would be the axis of rotation. It could also rotate about this axis over here. In this case, we're rotating about that axis. Or it could be rotating about this axis, in which case, this is the rotation that I'm considering. And in each of these cases, the moment of inertia against rotation, the inertia against rotation, will of course be a different one. It's a different number here, different number here, different number here, because mass is distributed differently with respect to the center of mass. And because of that, there are different moments of inertia for each of these three rotational directions. And that means if we have a general rotation in 3D, we cannot describe this by just one number anymore. It's not that or that or that. Uh, in principle, if you consider, let's say, a slender and long beam, just like the pen I'm holding in my hand here, if it's rotating 
about this axis, it's nothing else but a disk or a cylinder. But if it's rotating about this axis, it's a long and slender beam, and about that one as well. So in this particular case, we've seen that based on the axis about which we're rotating, the moment of inertia is different. And to capture that, we introduce this tensor, which captures the moments of inertia about all possible axes. In simple terms, you could think about this as being a matrix, which on the diagonal has exactly these three components. If you want to understand this better, just wait until next week when we'll talk about this tensor in more detail and understand its structure and how to calculate it easily and so forth. That's basically it for week number five. Have a good one. Ciao.